Thank you, David. That was a very nice introduction for you. I'm just David mentioned I work with potential real estate investors, and we are engaging in institutional quantity of real estate across the country in Florida as well. We're actually a, a very active investor in major metropolitan areas in Florida. So my talk here today will be centered around the institutional perspective on commercial real estate. And then I'm going to mention a little bit on the space market. On the investment market, the four main states of institutional real estate, like office, residential, retail, and warehouse. Actually, I will, not, I will use the word, the commercial real estate market is booming in roughly one third of uh, areas in the country but it's not booming in every part of the country. And as a result is that we saw the last booming period that ended in 2008. And we may refer to maybe we are facing another crash in the near future. The answer is no, history always repeats itself and history never repeats itself exactly. So let's not infer what happened in 2007 and 8 and we are facing another crash in the, in the near future, particularly in places like in Washington DC, in New York City, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, for example. My short answer is that we're not facing a crash in any time soon, and we're not gonna repeat exactly the experience we just learned from the 2008 experience. And the reason I start with the space market are really two factors that drive the commercial real estate market. Why is the space market, I'm not, one thing about space market, when our demand supply, most importantly, the occupancy and rent and income growth trends. And actually the fact that drive the real estate market over short term, far more powerful than the space market is what's going on in the capital market. The most important factor in the capital market, of course, is interest rate, but the second most important factor, which is equally important, is the overall risk taken in the economy. And real estate by and large is a risky asset. Now risk appetite is very relevant for commercial real estate as well. So the demand side is easier to talk about. It moves a little slower. The job creation is tied to demand for commercial real estate of all kinds. We lost about 8.75 million jobs from, a, from peak to the bottom in our last cycle. We recovered recover about 2.7 million jobs or so approximately. And then we still have a whole about 6 million jobs or more to go before we recover to the previous peak we saw before the downturn. The short answer is the economy is poised to generate healthy jobs going forward. And here's the definition, what I mean by healthy jobs. If it generates two minimum jobs per year, that's per year, not per, per month, then that's a healthy job creation. If it's 1.5 million jobs, it's very weak, it's not enough to keep the employment going down because the labor force expanding. 2.5 million jobs per year is strong, and three million jobs per year is super strong. And uh, given the constraint in the credit market and overall, the overall leverage in the economy is still very, very high. And going forward, I do not see a super strong job creation. What you see on the chart is the most recent forecast from a data supplier called Moody's Analytics. But I do see a healthy job creation. If you ask me for the next five years, I feel very confident that we can generate 10 million jobs per five years which means on average about two million jobs per year. As a matter of fact, that's my personal prediction for this year as well. And we probably will generate two million jobs in a healthy environment going forward. That's actually very condu conducive for the overall recovery of the office, residential, retail, office, retail, and the warehouse market going forward. The other one is you may wonder why I have a healthy view for the US economy going forward. Now, many reasons why is they actually, every recovery, the number one driver is pent up demand. The most visible chart I put here is really demand for vehicles. On average, a car can only last that long. And beyond a certain age, you get, it, it breaks down all the time, you get fed up with it, guess what do you do? I gotta buy a new one. And look at how long we have sent in the cars in a period at very soft hard level, if anything. I actually believe, if you look at the 2012 well sale cars far more, then a little bit more than what you see on the chart here. This again is the most recent projection for Moody's Analytics. This is not a pent up demand for car consumption. That's also uh, pent up demand for travel. That's also pent up demand for going to restaurants. You may wonder is where is the pent up demand for travel? I give a prime example. When the hotel market started to recover in April of 2010, 
The speed of recovery surprised from 80 personal professionals in the industry. And they forgot only one factor when they factor into recovery speed. That was pent up demand. When people travel regularly for a while, and suddenly it's two years in a row, you're not coming to Florida anymore from a cold place like Boston, New Jersey, like where I live. And guess what? I was here months ago because it was too cold in the northern part of the country. So consumption of travel is, has a huge pent up demand, and so is the consumption of shoes. A runner has to run a few pairs of shoes every year. And as a result, there's a huge amount of pent up demand across all sectors of the economy, and that's the number one driver for the economic recovery going forward. The number two driver is the businesses are doing very well. And not very well, you saw, you saw the Sam's chart is that the domestic profits right now is about $1.5 trillion. The overall US business, the global profits included, is about $2 trillion. And given multiplied by 10, that's a $20 trillion stock market, for example. And most important, the profits as a share of GDP is also at a level we have never seen before. Uh, individuals have e difficulty investing our money because you stuff your money in the mattress about the same way of putting your money in the bank. As a matter of fact, many banks are actually charging a fees at this stage. Companies are facing the exact same issue. Sooner or later, they have to invest. Earning a 0% of interest is not an option for corporate CEOs as well and going forward. So the corporate investment in, in going forward will be growing at a level much stronger than the overall expansion of GDP going forward, the consumer burden, the debt overall for the US economy, private and public included, was roughly flat. There was no deleveraging or very little deleveraging overall. There was significant deleveraging on the private sector over the last three years, but there was very little overall deleveraging in the US economy in terms of public and private debt combined. But having said, the consumer debt went down and far more importantly, the interest rate went down. If you combine the two forces together, and this is the consumer debt services, a share of the overall uh, dispos disposable income, that level is not at a historical level, low level, but nevertheless, it is very, very low, and consumers will not be the driver for economic growth going forward, but they will continue to, I mean, they will resume their healthy spending patterns going forward because the debt service burden to them is reasonable. And they will have reasonable amount of disposable income going forward to spend to power the economy as well. The, the, and there are other reasons actually, because export environment is very, we actually export growth, the export volume we're having today is way, way beyond the peak level we saw in 2007. So export growth is a, a driver as well. But when I focus all on the demand side, so I put up on the supply chart is, Basically, going forward is that supply is of very little concern for overall, and the supply level today was lower, or a year ago was lower than the supply peak bottom level we saw in the 1991 recession. And if you, got, if you remember in the industry, 1991 real estate recession was called the commercial, the real estate market depression, and similar to the level we saw in 1990s, uh, 1930s. So as a result, we will have an extended period of very little supply growth. And the one area that we are seeing supply growth right now is residential market with the rental market. And it's also in Florida, by the way. And we are one of the sponsors who are sponsoring residential development in the Florida markets as well. And you must see a little bit new construction that is surprising, surprising in the hotel sector in places like in Manhattan. San Francisco, even the secondary cities like Austin, Texas, for example, for a simple reason, their occupancy levels are the highest they have ever seen. They truly need hotels at this stage, but not at a very large scale. So uh, supply is very limited uh, consideration, and demand is coming back, so the overall space market is highly in favor of investment activities for the like, next several years. The next one you look at is the investment market. As I mentioned, I really two things that really drive the investment market. One is the benchmark interest rates, which is at a level I've never seen before. That's the lowest interest rate for a long period of time. We really haven't seen a 2% or below 10-year treasury yield for basically since the 1950s. And the 0% 
short-term interest rate is something we have never seen before. And the second one, do not have a chart here, that really drive also the vanish in commercial real estate is the risk appetite. The risk appetite, they really increased drastically since the recession in 2009. Of course, it goes up and down a little bit, but the trend line was a drop of the risk premium and increase in risk appetite that also increased demand for commercial real estate overall. As a, res as a result, the market responded. In the bottom of last cycle in, term of, in terms of cap rate in 2008, it was overall a weighted average of all sectors in the liquid property index, that's National Council of Real Estate Investment Fiduciaries Index. It was 5.4%. A quarter before, it was the lowest level was about 5.8%, went up a little bit as a fourth quarter, about 6%. Again, there's a little bit of a fluctuation. My personal view is that this year, the cap rate will end up at a level lower than the one we saw at the end of last year, which was about 6%. It's from where somewhere about 5 7% would be my guess. For two reasons, the income are growing up, are start to move up, not just in residential, in other sectors as well, and interest rate risk premium is continuing to come down, and if anything, the interest rate for commercial mortgages most likely will come down a little bit further, and that's very conducive for valuation commercial real estate. So I see a, a marginal drop in cap rates for this year, again, from 6%, say, to 5.7% overall. Okay. And the liquid property index, that's a benchmark we have for many of our investments. And I want to draw attention to the returns in 2003, 2004, and 2005. And you see a lot of returns start recovering. The stock, the, the occupancy in office market reached the bottom in October of 2009, 2003. Then it started to go up in terms of occupancy because the vacancy rate started to go down. That was the first year of recovering commercial real estate market. And the first year of recovering commercial real estate market in this cycle was 2010. Those 2010 was similar to 2003, 2011 was similar to 2004, and 2012 is similar to 2005. That is in terms of space market conditions, in terms of economic investment performance, the pattern is not the same. 2003, 2004, 2005 returns went up every single year. But this time, the speed of change in the capital market was so faster, this time you will not see this year's return, will not see the past return we have last year. It's more of a flat three years. We have a 13.1% in 2010. We have about 14.3% in 2011. And this year, problem somewhere lower than either of those two numbers, but still in a double digit a year. This will be a three years of double digit returns. And it depends on overall economic environment. For 2013, for example, the odds are not in favor of have a double digit returns in the commercial real estate market. It's probably a high single digit for 2013. But 2012 on this year, I still see a no single double digit return. Again, I want to draw the contrast. The different pattern is driven by the speed of recovery in the, in the investment market and in the capital market overall. The other one is that is the, in terms of commercial real estate market recovery overall in the transactions market, we are about somewhere between 5 to 10 percent below the overall peak price we achieved in late 2007. In sectors, for example, in residential, we talk, we talk about rental apartments, in every measure, that's price, that's income, that's yield, they all have surpassed, in terms of yield, they went down below. They all have fully recovered in every metric and surpassed the previous peak in terms of pricing per door per unit as well as in terms of income generated per unit as well. It's called a full recovery. And the other sector is a self-storage we are not recovering here. It also has experienced a full recovery in terms of price, in terms of yield, in terms of uh, income as well. Other sectors are still below their peak level, less, less office, less warehouse, less retail as well. And the next one, the transactions volume. Of course, I highlighted the chart 2011 versus 2004. If you remember, I mentioned that 2009 was very similar to, uh, 2010 was very similar to 2003 as well. And this, what drives the transactions market, and first and foremost, you might be surprised, it is not in level interest rates. It is the overhaul of the space market. That's the number one driver. 
and the two-thirds of driver for transaction volume is the overall health of the space market. When the space market is healthy and strong, rents start to move up, investors are very confident. And they start investing in commercial real estate of all sectors, of all sizes, of all different places. And you have a fully, very strong, very active investment market. When the property market fundamentals are very weak, interest rate very low, and investors view real estate not as a real estate per se, they view it as a segment real estate as a substitute for fixed income investments. As a result, like in 2010, for example, or even in 2009, investors were focused on the biggest markets, the biggest properties, and the fully leased properties, hopefully with a 30-year leases, for example, I'm exaggerating a little bit. And they will not view them as real estate, they view them as a fixed income yield because they're earning 2% on a 10-year treasury yield, 3% for corporate bonds. So if I earn a 4-person commercial real estate, best office building in Manhattan, guess what? It's better than my fixed income yield. But as a result, in that environment, transaction volume is reasonable, but it's very shallow. Only a portion market gets transacted, the rest of the market has very little transaction volume. So this year, last year was very similar to 2004 because the space market fundamentals were very similar. And this year I see an increase in transaction volume because of the healthy job creation. The fundamentals will be closer to 2005 and 2004. So as a result, is the transaction volume this year will be somewhere between 2004 and 2005, closer to 2005, but somewhere between those two. So we have, we'll have an increase in transaction activities overall this year <coughs> relative to last year. Okay. For office market, the first one is this is a relative return. It's the return difference between office and the national average of all sectors. It's not an absolute return. When it's the, when it's the areas in the positive territory, it means office doing better overall than the overall real estate. When it is in the negative territory, it means office not doing as well. And the, the only comment I have is that office is called a late boomer. In the early during the recession or early stage recovery, office market always underperforms. If we, as you have seen the last cycle of the last two or three years, we were in the bottom recession, we have seen the initial stage recovery. Once we have about job creation, two to three years of very healthy job uh, creation, stock market, the office market start to boom and it start to outperform. So next year may be a transition year, but in this cycle, over the next five years, you have three years of the next five years, the office market will outperform the national average. I call it late boomer for the office market. The second word I use to describe the office market called high beta. And if you look at overemployment growth, like one is office employment, one the other is overemployment. Office employment is always goes up when the job is positive more and it comes down more when the market comes down. So demand for office space is more volatile than demand for the all space combined overall because the job creation is a direct indicator of demand for all types of space. And indeed, office market has a large beta, which means in a downturn market, office loses more in value in an average. In an upward movement, once it gets started, office market outperforms. In a recovery market, so again, over the next five years, my personal prediction is that office will have a three out of five years of very strong performance going forward on a relative basis. The third one is the office market cycle is highly predictable. And I, I actually literally compare a chart I prepared in 2003. In December 2003, with the recovery pattern, it overlaps so closely that it was just a perfect overlap. So what I'm talking about is there's very little new construction for office for this year, next year, several years going forward. So it, the demand recovery, it is really the job creation. It's anything you sort of drop in vacancy, and I think the drop, this is a third party projection, the drop will be a little bit faster than what being presented over here. The reason I've been nice, I see a healthier job creation, not very strong, but healthier job creation than embedded in this forecast. We have five years minimum, very healthy, every year we're better in in terms of fundamentals in the office market, better occupancy, higher rent growth overall for the office market for several years going forward. Okay. And office market uh, in particular is highly concentrated. The office market, warehouse market, and hotel markets 
are highly concentrated in the field, very large markets across the country. The biggest markets such as Washington, D.C., New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston, for example. Those are gateway markets. And th those five markets represent about 55 55% of overall liquid investments in the office sectors. They're highly concentrated. So in issue, in issue, we have a weird phenomenon in commercial real estate. In the stock market, the bigger companies on average have a smaller beta. Okay? The smaller companies have a, a bigger beta, means more volatile, up and down. That's what a bigger beta is about. In real estate, it's the opposite. The bigger cities has a bigger beta. Smaller cities has a smaller beta. It's the opposite relationship. The big assets has a bigger beta. Smaller assets, on average, has a smaller beta. So size in real estate is positive related to beta. The volatility and size in stock market is negative related to its beta and volatility. So as a result, in the initial recovery was highly concentrated in a few very large markets like New York, Washington, D.C., and San Francisco, for example. And I think over the like next two or three years, that investing intensity will gradually spread. It's already in Seattle. It's, it's a very hot market. It is already in Austin, for example. It's going to spread eventually come here to Miami as well. It's a lag market and this stage for the national office market. For the apartment market, okay, uh, four slides as well. The first one is relative return. Again, this is a relative, not absolute. When the market went down like 2009, every sector went down. Just which one went down less? In this case, for example, the rest apartment market historically has always, it's called early boomer. It's the opposite of office market. When in a recessionary era and the initial recovery, apartment market, which is true this time, it was true in last recessions as well, always outperformed the national average. It's called the early boomer sector. Yeah. And if you look at that, all performance coming down, and it may outperform a little bit this year. I do not see the rental apartments for the next five years to outperform the national average. And this pattern you can see is very, very clear. This again is an early boomer sector as opposed to the office, which is a late boomer sector. Again, those I'm talking about investment performance. Okay. The next one are many factors that decide the future of apartments, rental market. The factor that is more important than anything else is home ownership. Roughly one third, we have a home ownership as end of the most recent number is about 66.3%. From peak level, more than 69%, for example. The significance of that is every time when the home ownership moves by one point up and down, it drives the demand for rental household by a factor of three, because a rental household is one third of the overall household. So if the, uh, if the home ownership drops by 1%, so that it generates additional 3% demand for rental household. And 3% demand is more than two years of natural demand growth in the whole economy, assuming a reasonable, healthy job creation environment. So that really drives the incremental demand. That's what drove the demand for, commercial, for rental housing. Three factors. One is the downward shift in home ownership. The other, of course, is the, uh, the little bit of job creation as well we had over the last two years or so. And also the third one is the foreclosure crisis. Many people got foreclosed out of their own, their own mark, homes, they start to rent. So this is the factor that's most volatile and most unpredictable. For one reason is that Americans have a propensity to own. Giving you, giving you a choice, you will own your home. The reason many people are not own their home, not because Americans, we as a population, has, as a people, has changed our habit. Because two thirds of our, our friends, Amer fellow Americans, couldn't get a mortgage and they could not purchase a home. That's why they get forced out of the home ownership market, not because they think naturally they will prefer to rent versus owning a home. Okay. That, of course, the vacancy as a result is a job creation, the giant change in ownership, home ownership, and foreclosure crisis really drove the vacancy rate down for the rental apartments. As a matter of fact, the rental apartments across the country, also roughly 70% of markets across the country are very tight. In a sense, the income growth and rent growth are approaching double digits, generally 7 to 10%. And we have experience close to 10% income growth for rental apartments for two years in a row. And this year, again, 
was uh, around 10% of overall increase in rental income because the demand is very high and supply is limited and occupancy is high as well, so you have the room to move the rents. Okay. And then this is that this chart is relative versus apartment rent versus the mortgage payment is the relative affordability of rent versus owning. And if the chart goes very high, means the rental is very expensive. If the number is low, means rental is cheap. In the peak market, housing market in 2006, the rental was very, very cheap relative to owning a home. And people still want to buy a house, of course, at later. And today, as a matter of fact, rental nationwide is more expensive versus owning a home. Assume you could afford to have a home and your credit score is good enough that bank, uh, banks will give you a mortgage, for example. And that's the assumption. Not everybody could get a mortgage in this stage. So now the rental is owning, and as a matter of fact, this chart, if I look at the single family housing market trend of, relative, of affordability relative to the medium home, home price index, this chart points to a, a trend very similar to the level I saw in 2004 for the rest of your single family housing market, as a matter of fact. And this chart, uh, this chart I will keep a very close look at for like three or four years. And that's a very powerful indicator. Once the credit market starts to move, and what kind of home ownership will change going forward. Okay. And we have a little bit read on the retail market. Okay. And if you look at here, the one question is that look at during the recession in 2009, actual retail overall did pretty well relative to the overall market. So the chart here, if you look at the 2002 to 2004, and you see it was actually did better. And then 2006, 2008 did not as good. As a result, the, re re the retail is also, I won't call it earning boomer because during the recession, consumer spending does come down, or the growth of consumer expenditures does go slow down quite a bit. Is actually the apartments, self-storage, and retail is a sector we call no beta sectors. Office hotel are high beta sectors, and in a low beta sector, generally speaking, a down market goes down a little bit less. In the major booming market, it goes up a little less, and that was the reason. So for retail, it is just like residential, just like self-storage. It is a low beta sector, so in a poor, in a downturn market, that's a little bit better on a relative basis. In a major booming market, it doesn't do as well as the, uh, the big beta sectors, the office. And office is the biggest sector commercial real estate for private real estate investors. This one, the demand for retail, we have lots of issues, of course. We have job creation over income growth and, and savings as well. One factor I would like to call attention is running the labor income that's basically called compensation to employees, including benefits as a share of GDP. That is a level we have never seen before, in part because we have high unemployment rate, in part because the labor, labor has very, a very weak bar bargaining power today relative to some years ago. And as a result is that, but having said that, that number can go down any further, and it is possible. Another possibility is when the job market starts move, not reach, you start to go up. As a matter of fact, I do actually see positive demand potential going forward because of employ increasing the economy, increasing jobs, and most importantly, that ratio most likely is going to trend up going forward rather than coming down. But this is very note that the beginning of the chart was 1960 for a long period of time. So this is a historical low point. And the, in honest, the one way top one point when it's historic low, as a re researcher, very often I just think about the possibility of going up rather than keep going, going down, going down because very often that is a moment of inflection point. I actually do believe we are at an inflection point for this market as the employment, unemployment rate comes down and the labor market demand goes up a little bit and that number is likely to go up and that generates a very powerful demand for retail sales because 1% of that chart represents $150 billion because we have 15 more, more than $15 trillion US economy. One point shift is $150 billion of demand for retail, okay, for retail expenditures. The other one for retail space is that for office, hotels, and warehouse space, they're highly concentrated in the biggest markets in this country. As I mentioned, is that five largest office markets represent more than 55% of institutional investments in this country, 
but retail and apartments follow people, okay? Which means that I would never, for example, it would be very difficult as a member investment committee to recommend investments in office building or Oklahoma City, if you know anybody from Oklahoma, it's just, there's no offense here. Like even in Salt Lake City, for example, those are secondary and tertiary markets. But I have no problems buying a good shopping center in Salt Lake City or Oklahoma City or apartment buildings. So retail follows people and has a far less concentration. This charge is industry lab point. So it's the, there's a lesser distinguishing separation between major markets of retail secondary markets retail or tertiary markets retail because you will find good investments in all those markets for retail. The second uh, attribute retail is the quantity prevails. This is my recommendation for our investment strategies. No matter in good times, booming times like 2004 and 2005, awful times like 2009, retailers are only one thing. If I want to buy a grocery shopping center, lifestyle center, power center, or a shopping mall, my first question to our transactions professional is this, is that a top tier shopping center in the city? If it is not, let's not do them. The reason is that retail has never been an issue of over construction. Retail has always an issue of under demolishment. As a result is that the shopping centers, this is the one third, the best shopping centers versus the bottom one third of the worst shopping centers in any time period to look at. The good shopping centers in good times, bad times, and times in between always outperform and for a good economic reason. So as a result, institutional investors like us, and my strategy, as I said, is the number of investors are uh, specialists on retail is that retail, you go with the best shopping centers, whether it's in Orlando, or in Raleigh, Durham, in New Jersey, in San Diego, any places go, we go with the best shopping centers. And the second one is the retail, let's invest in the primary markets, investment in secondary market as well because there are dominant shopping centers in big cities, like New, I mean, the big metropolitan areas like Washington, D.C. There are very dominant shopping centers in the second market right here in Orlando, for example. Okay. The next one for the warehouse market. And then when I talk about industrial market, here's a chart of just, we're well, running top of warehouse market. Warehouse market is 85% of the industrial market overall. The rest market is most uh, flag space and showroom. They follow the trend of the office market. Because the, the R&D and space and flag space, again, the demand and supply and price and trends, they follow the office market. The warehouse is a, the word I used to call the baby version of the office market. We're already talking about warehouse market here in terms of industrial. Uh, industrial, look at this is the same scale of charts as you saw before. It goes up and down a little bit, but it doesn't have those big areas of up and big areas of down. So actually, overall investment trend for warehouse that follows the national trend very well has a beta of one. Okay. So again, it's not exact zero, but again, the, all the charts we saw before, they were capped in the exact same scale. If you look at the areas, they are very small, and they are smaller version of the office market. So. That's the, that's the definition of warehouse market. It's also a little bit late boomer, smaller version, but it doesn't boom as much. It generally does a little bit better once uh, we have two or three years of very strong job creation. Okay. And industrial market vacancy, there's only one direction. It's coming down going forward because of there's very little new construction and uh, we, we all anticipate some job creation over like several years, so every year, the vacancy will come down is matter of speed and how fast will come down going forward. Okay. Here I give you the top, the biggest container ports globally around the country. Okay. And they are very relevant because the big portion of usage for warehouse space is for imported goods, particularly from Asia. If you look at here, the biggest ports, the Shanghai uh, uh, port of Singapore, port of Hong Kong, Actually, our two ports, Lex to Hong Kong, is called Port of Shenzhen, number four, and Port of Guangzhou, number eight. Actually, it's the biggest port area globally is Lex to Hong Kong. Again, those are three ports right next to each other. It's the biggest port activities. The second biggest port activity is Port of Shanghai, 
and there's a port next to Shanghai, it's called Port Ningbo, number six, which is a port right next to Shanghai. That's the second large uh, container port activities globally. The third largest area is running the port of Singapore that service Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, and actually is transporting goods for Vietnam, Thailand as well. So those ports, and they are th not just come to the United States, but big portion of that activity is coming to the United States. You look at the biggest port is number seven as Port of Los Angeles and, you, and, and Long Beach. Again, one physical port, but two jurisdictions, two ownerships. And we have the port of number 19 is Port of New York, New Jersey. One physical port is, was, is sort of co administered uh, co-managed by two entities, but actually there's a port authority that manages that. But those are relatively smaller ports. The relevance of that is that given the widening of Panama Canal, the East Coast ports will benefit quite a bit. So after 19, 2014, the, the big container ports in the East Coast, as the Port of Charleston, Port of Savannah, Port of Norfolk, Port of Miami, and Port of Jacksonville. And we have a few, few smaller ports uh, here, but the, the Port of Philadelphia, Port of Baltimore, Port of Boston, those are not significant container ports. Port of Baltimore and Philadelphia, for example, those are very large inland ports because there's a big bay. Big ships really couldn't go that close to Port of Philadelphia, for example. So as a result, so the Port of Miami, Port of Jacksonville, right here in Florida will benefit. As a matter of fact, Port Jacksonville is very well positioned to benefit from the increased volume from Asia because of widening the Panama Canal, which is scheduled to be completed in 2014, that the larger ships can sail directly from the, across the Pacific Ocean, coming to Port of Jacksonville, for example. So those are activities that are going to reshape the overall demand for re uh, warehouse space across the country. The major line we call the, is going to push the equal cost line, shifting from Port of Los Angeles come to the East Coast versus Port of Jackson going to the West Coast. That line is somewhere in the two thirds into the East Coast. And that line, because the widening of Panama Canal is going to shift westward somewhat. And that is going to challenge the overall redistribution of warehouse space demand going forward. Okay. Overall, I know that really what I see is I see a favorable return environment for this year versus 2010 and 2011. There were very good returns. I also see a transaction volume because, in, largely because of the increase in the in, in demand overall improving, improving in fundamentals and also stable interest environment. I see a high risk taking it's beyond core increase in value added activities and beyond the major markets and coming down to more of so in secondary markets beyond apartments as well. And office is running a labor boomer, it's a high beta sector for investment for in terms of investment performance. And apartment is the sector that we have to keep very close attention for the next five years because there are lots of issues. Economic growth is one, home ownership is another one. The echo boomer demographics over the short term is very good for apartment demand, but if you look at five years down the road, it's not very good because echo boomer generation is coming to an end. And also, the most important, the relative re demand preference by Americans in terms of renting versus owning homes going forward. And in terms of retail, there's less geographic concentration in terms of a concentration in bigger cities, but there's a far stronger preference for the best shopping centers across the country by institutional investors. For a warehouse space, the traditional factors, access to seaport, the access to the population center, and also intermodal facilities, particular truck to uh, Rio, for example, there, those were the traditional factors to determine where our hospital space will be located. Going forward, those factors are still relevant. There are three more factors, as I mentioned, Panama Canal is one, and also the logistics of online retailers. The retail, if you ask me, the three retailers that are, have fundamentally changed the re American retail landscape, Walmart was number one. Fundamental change, of course, we have others like Target, but those are copy uh, similar companies like Walmart. The second one was Costco. Okay? And the third one that is fundamentally changing the retail landscape is Amazon.com. So the online logistics, online retailers, given that if you were to pick up only three, let's like spend over a 50 year period, that fundamentally change the way we shop against Walmart, it is Costco and it's Amazon.com 
today and for the like next 15 years. Okay. And so the online retail, retailer strategy is very important and also important export activities. We are export a little bit more today. We are import uh, relative in terms of growth a little bit less. Import uses warehouse space far more than export. So as a result, how those kind of activities reshape the warehouse space across the country. And those are three new factors I look for a warehouse investment going forward. So that is my prepared presentation. And maybe we could have one or two questions. Yes. Are there any macro trends on the office employment and demand for space versus, versus virtual office and, and telecommuting and so forth that you guys are tracking and, and, and how is that affecting your, your, your thinking on that? Yeah, actually for office demand, of course, uh, one thing I just mentioned is that I think when the, uh, one more comment is we, say we are using on, everything online, maybe we don't use paper anymore because everything is on a computer Why we need to use a, a uh, paper stuff. But if you look at how much paper consumption today is far bigger than we ever had because it's so easy, so much easier to print a 20 page, 200 page document, right? We use paper far more today than many years ago because sometimes, again, at one time I sent a wrong uh, document. I never intended to print it, it was 180 pages. So I wasted 180 pages of paper. So as we get wealthier, very often we are going to have secondary homes. We don't generate less demand for homes. We have more homes. And also that as we society get richer, we telecommute is more mobile. We are not going to demand for lesser office space. We are going to demand actually more office space. So overall, the office space, the demand going for, I would look at only one factor. So telecommuting, every other factor are all relevant, but I only look at one factor. That's, all, that, that's the job creation going forward. The other one, deeper fact to look at, is we have fewer proportion class of office space today versus many years ago because of, the, because of the, we built fewer office space. So as a result, that the office demand for class is more specific, for example, can tighten up pretty fast and going forward. I think I, my time is up, and thank you very much. I really appreciate your attention.